The following program has been edited down from its original length and comes from the DVD, Debunking Evolution. Visit us today to obtain the whole program. Is it just me, or is natural selection kind of blind when it comes to evolution? John! Where is he? Huh. Let's see here. Ooh. Messing with my privacy. Huh? Ow! John! Are you okay? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Are you sure you're okay? Yeah, no, I, I, I just got back from the eye doctors. Uh, they dilated my pupils. Um, getting here was a little dicey, but I'm starting to see a lot better now. Uh, then why are you talking to a coat rack? I thought you were looking a little taller. I was gonna get your help deciding on what swatches to pick out, but I think this is a really bad time. No, 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 I, I can do it. Give me a try. Okay, well, I started out by liking this one. Yeah, this one. But uh, then I figure I'd tune it back a bit. Yeah, what do you think? I like this one. Yeah. Mm, no. Mm, I think we're gonna work on this a little later. Whatever. We better get to studying. What are we studying today? Natural selection. I've already started reading it. There's a great definition in our biology textbook. Natural selection is the process by which organisms with variation most suited to their local environment survive and leave more offspring. So evolutionary theory holds that natural selection is one of the forces that drives evolution? How's that work? Well evolutionists say a mutation happens in the sex cells of a creature and its offspring exhibits the resulting trait difference, like a new feather color or something. The trait can give it an advantage or a disadvantage. A beneficial mutation would cause it to become a little better at surviving in an environment than the non-mutants. So its descendants, and thus the trait, eventually outnumber the others. Then the scenario repeats with another variation, supposedly driving evolution forward. But rather than this process producing just the varieties we see among animal kinds, they believe this process built those animals from completely different ones, and can eventually lead to one kind of animal turning into another. But this has never been observed. Fish are still fish, and finches are still finches. And here in the biology textbook, they point out that the polar bear had the advantage as a predator in the snow because of its white coat. And it also shows that if you start with yellow and green grasshoppers, two different traits inherited from the parents, the green may outnumber the yellow in a green environment because they are harder for birds to see and catch. So, did the grasshoppers think through how other animals would avoid it if it looked more camouflage? Did it know how to genetically engineer itself to express those colors? Did a polar bear engineer its own white coat? No, but that's not what evolutionists believe. They think that these changes happen randomly in the DNA, influencing an individual's survivability. Evolution is a blind process, no offense. Intelligent choices supposedly have nothing to do with it. Evolutionists believe natural selection figured out how to design an eye. But how? It would have to build and preserve over who knows how many generations hundreds of complicated interacting eye parts, including proteins that were all useless until the whole package was eventually assembled. How'd it know to engineer animals for flight? Or a navigation system so tiny it can fit in the head of a monarch butterfly, which is smaller than a pin? How'd it wire a human brain that's far more complicated than our best computers if it is a totally blind process with no goal or purpose in view? You're right. Natural selection is just a process. It doesn't have a brain. It can't think or design. It had no foreknowledge of what it was trying to accomplish. And yet, coupled with mutations, it's been assigned godlike powers to create things way beyond man's understanding. Yes! It's like they've replaced God's power with random mutations and natural selection. As the textbook points out, it favors a creature's overall ability to survive, but the actual changes are happening deep down in the creature on a microscopic level inside the genes. Wait, 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 wait. So you're saying that when certain individuals die, all their genes just go away? 
Meaning that natural selection has no power in selecting individual genes? Well, it can't see genes, just whole organisms. Kind of like me trying to help you pick out swatches that I can't even see. But it looks like you're doing better now. I am. So how about this one? Or maybe not. <clears throat> also, natural selection is supposed to mean survival of the fittest. But what if <clears throat> someone, nobody in particular, you know, had their eyes dilated and was leaving when they knocked over the fish tank in the waiting room? You did it. Anyway, if exactly half of them died because I di they didn't get them in the water, was it survival of the fittest? <laughs> no, it was survival of the luckiest. Yeah, well, <clears throat> here's a picture of two mutant flies and a normal one. Which one do you think is the most likely to survive in a particular environment? None of them. When I hit him with my fly swatter. All right, all right, all right. The normal one would probably survive best, but it depends on the environment, right? Yeah. So evolution that turns a simpler organism into a fruit fly relies on mutants becoming better able to survive as new genetic information is added and then surviving to pass their genes onward. Mutants are usually worse off since most mutations are harmful and natural selection actually cleanses the population by killing the less fit mutants. This might help keep the most effective traits within a population. So the real world works exactly opposite of what evolution requires. Bingo. And while lots of small mutations can give a survival advantage in specific environments, virtually all the real life examples show a loss of genetic information, not a gain. Evolutionists have tried to propose various genetic explanations, like gene duplication, but they are putting their faith in a process that has never actually been observed. What's gene duplication? It's when a whole gene accidentally gets copied and then it mutates to become another new gene. Nice story. Have scientists ever seen that happen? Nope. Never. And most examples of supposed evolution in action involve things like chemical pathways and small changes in proteins, but how do you get a fin to turn into a limb and then a human hand? They tell interesting stories about how it must have just happened, but I can't find any evidence it actually happened. So, a typical mutation removes information, but only a mutation that can add information really explain how philosophers came from fish. And if you think about it, natural selection can't create anything. It can only deselect by killing whole individuals with traits that are already present in a population. Wow, you're right. You can only select something that is already present. How could nature ever add information to some DNA by subtracting some of what is already there? Great question. And speaking of information, here's another question evolutionists have not even come close to answering. How could chemicals from early Earth spontaneously form molecules with information? That's a stretch. So, natural selection can't do anything without mutations, and mutations can't even happen unless DNA forms from some muddy puddle billions of years ago. You got it. There is no known mechanism for creating information like we find in DNA from simple matter. Information always comes from a mind. And God is the mind behind creating the DNA in the first place. Yeah, but the biggest problem I have with natural selection being able to create new kinds of animals is found right here in our biology textbook. Let me see if I can find it. You're starting to see really well. I am. Now, Charles Darwin is credited for discovering natural selection and describing how it led to the evolution of different animals and plants. Right here it tells the story. After reading Malthus, Darwin realized that if more individuals are produced than can survive, members of a population must compete to obtain food, living space, and other limited necessities of life. Darwin described this as the struggle for existence. Malthus? Oh, I remember him from history. He believed much of the world's problems were due to people reproducing faster than our food supply. Right. Evolution claims that a never-ending chain of struggle and death is what created life. But the Bible paints a different picture. Genesis 3 says that death, pain, and suffering came from man's rebellion against God. And Romans 8 is clear that Earth is under a curse because of our sin. But God didn't leave it there. 1 Corinthians 15 says that one day death will be conquered. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 
the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So death is a horrible thing. The Bible calls death the punishment for our sins and the last enemy. Because Jesus Christ took that penalty in our place, we beat death by getting to spend an eternity with God. Evolutionary history says death of the unfit over eons changed fish into humans. But biblical history says that death changed already created humans and fish and the whole universe into a place with problems that Jesus will one day solve. Wow, it seems so strange that the things our, our textbook says could have so much to do with what we believe about the past and about reality. Okay, speaking of beliefs, how would you define religion? I know this from class. It's basically defined as a system of beliefs. Right, so would evolution qualify as a religion? Well, okay, the struggle for survival over millions of years of death is what supposedly created the different kinds of life on Earth, including humans. The Bible tells us death is an enemy, not the hero. But Jesus, the Creator, promises us life if we choose to follow Him. He has overcome death by rising from the grave. So, natural selection has no intelligence and can't even select what's happening on the genetic level. It can only subtract from what is already present in DNA, and it relies on death to create new kinds of life. Wow. You know, I'm really starting to see that natural selection really doesn't have the power that evolution needs, you know, to turn fish into apes and then people. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? This program is brought to you by Awesome Science Media, an organization committed to producing high-quality science-focused television content, all from a biblical worldview. Be sure to sign up for our email newsletter to find out about our new titles and get deals on our content. To learn more about who we are, visit our website and online store at awesomesciencemedia.com. You can now get access to all of our programming on our video on demand platform at awesomesci.tv.com with a low monthly subscription rate of $4.99. And for a limited time, the first seven days are free, so you can check us out before you commit. Subscribe today and get access to every episode and documentary we have produced. Not only will you get access to all of our programs, but every behind the scenes video, blooper reels, interview clips, scientist testimony, producer video blog, on-site production previews, and spherical production videos. Awesome Sci TV will also be the place where we release our newest content, so you'll be the first in the world to see our newest episodes and documentaries. We're always producing content, so new titles will be added as soon as we release them. No matter where you live on the globe, if you have internet, you can subscribe to Awesome Sci TV. So what are you waiting for? Check us out today. Sign up for a seven-day trial. You'll have the choice to sign up for our monthly package or save money by signing up for our yearly subscription. But if you don't want to subscribe, Awesome Sci TV also offers each title for rent or for purchase. View our content from our website or download it to your computer or mobile device when you purchase it. It's easy to access any of our titles. Get all of our great programming and build up your faith in God's Word. Remember, for a limited time, you can sign up for a seven-day free trial. Go to AwesomeSciTV.com to sign up now. Is it just me? Or does the evolutionary tree seem more like an orchard? All right, let's see if we can do this. Nope, that doesn't stay up. No, you've gotta stay, stay. Hey Jane. So, gotta be honest, I haven't really had a chance to study too much. Uh-huh. But, Jane. Sorry, I was just taking a break. I got this new makeup case and I'm having a hard time figuring out where to put everything. Now, I could put this lipstick here. Or no, 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 no. Put I'll handle this. So we could organize it as simplest to most complex. Or by color. 
Ugh, see, organization just is not my thing. Once my little sister asked me to organize all her little tiny plastic animals, took me two days. Organizing animals? <laughs> it's like Carl Linnaeus. Who's that? Yeah, he was the first guy to classify animals. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I remember him now. Um, his motto was, God created, Linnaeus ordered. Yeah, his work is the basis for the classification system we still use today. Yeah, later, Charles Darwin sketched a diagram to show how life started simple and then branched out to every creature on Earth. Uh, he said the different branches represent the different levels of classification. A tree of life, if you will. Oh, yeah. I keep seeing this over and over again in our textbooks. Really? Yeah. Uh, huh, here we go. Check out this one. Are researchers still trying to figure out how it happened? There are a lot more of these diagrams. I think they change as different researchers group them based on different features. These charts show groups of organisms they believe share a common ancestor. Yeah, a group like that is called a clade. And these diagrams are called cladograms. Hmm. Man, and I thought organizing my makeup was hard. <laughs> so do they. Hmm. Well, not your makeup, classifying animals. Okay, so remember that modern evolutionary classification is a rapidly changing science with a difficult goal. To present all life on a single evolutionary tree. As evolutionary biologists study relationships among taxa, they regularly change not only the way organisms are grouped, but also sometimes the name of groups. Remember that cladograms are visual presentations of hypothesis about relationships and not hard and fast facts. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying our textbooks say that cladograms are based off hypotheses, not facts. Yeah. I'll show you why. Flip forward a page. That's because they only have living animals or fossils for certain places on the branches. These are real animals or fossils we've actually discovered. But these branching points are just imaginary lines that represent the hypotheses about which animals evolved from a common ancestor. No facts support them that can't also support different links or no links. The transitional fossils they represent have never been found. If they were, well, we'd see their pictures here, right? Though evolutionists point to a few examples, there should be thousands. Genesis 121 says, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. From the beginning, God created fully formed kinds of animals. So it isn't a tree like Darwin thought. Instead, it's an orchard. God created the different kinds of animals, and then they expressed all types of amazing variety as they bred within their kind. And recombining genetic possibilities that God packed into the original kinds produced that variety? Exactly. We see variation happening all the time, but we've never seen the evolutionary process of mutations and selection creating new kinds. So dogs, apes, and people can show variety, but can never morph into a new kind. Yep, just like the orchard. One basic tree kind can never become another. Scientists seem to name something a new species, even if there's only a minor change. And in the fossils, the smallest variation is classified as a different species, even though we see lots of variety with some species today. Like what? Like in dogs. Just think about all the variety in the breeds of dog kinds, Canis familiaris, in the last 200 years. If future paleontologists dug up the bones of a bulldog, a chihuahua, and a Great Dane, they would surely classify them as three different species, but they are all the same kind. Whether beaks of a finch change shape or a color of a moth, the changes are limited. When it's just expressing variety within the created kind. Yep, so evolutionists consider adjustments to existing traits evidence that evolution made those traits in the first place. So, what if God made each basic kind with potential to change some of its traits, but no potential to morph into a different kind? Dogs can breed with coyotes, and coyotes can breed with wolves. They call the coyote wolf, so they must all be part of the same created kind. So they have a common ancestor, but it was the original dog kind that God created, 
not the transition between a reptile and a mammal like they show in these textbooks. So fossils, the classification of animals, and the Bible are all in harmony. That's what it looks like. Well, all of that gives me an idea. What if we organize your makeup by kind? All the nail polish in one spot, all the eye stuff in another, and all the lip things elsewhere. That's brilliant! We do an orchard, not a tree. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? Is it just me, or is it kind of creepy that evolutionists say we're made up of spare parts? Working on your car? I can't hear you. Can you shut it off? I can't hear you because the car's on. What's in the box? Oh, you know, my car's leftover parts. I always have a few of them left over when I'm done working on it. Parts you don't need? Pretty sure. Are you, are you sure you don't need these? Or you know this? Not really, but I started the engine and it runs without this junk. You know, all this reminds me about what our textbook says about vestigial structures. Can you help me grab it out of my backpack? Mm. How do you not know what's in your car? <laughs> uh, something wrong? No, 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 but <clears throat> why don't you look it up for us? Oh, yeah, right, okay. Where is it? Oh, there it is right there. Vestigial structures are inherited from ancestors, but have lost much or all of their original function due to different selection pressures acting on the descendant. So they're saying that animals and people have leftovers in their bodies that once served a function in our evolutionary ancestors? <laughs> hey, just like the parts for my car. Exactly. The example they give here is the dolphin's hip bones. They're saying its ancestor used to walk on land. But once the dolphin evolved to live in water, it has useless leftover hip bones. What's funny is scientists recently discovered that marine animals, like whales, need these bones during mating season. The study was published in a 2014 article in the science journal Evolution. Wait, wait, wait. The name of the journal is Evolution. Yep. The one that claims they've discovered a purpose for these bones, which goes against the whole idea that these bones are mere evolutionary leftovers. That there's the definition of irony, isn't it? So, in the textbook, they call them useless, but in reality, these bones help the dolphin reproduce and survive. Exactly, and they say the same thing about humans. That we have dolphin hips? Not exactly, but close. They point out that our coccyx, the tailbone, is left over from when we had tails. They think we used to have tails? Yeah, but it's just the end of our backbone. I mean, it has to end somewhere, right? True. It's also the anchor for a bunch of muscles, right? Yes. Tiny muscles, tendons, and ligaments connect to it, and it supports something called the pelvic diaphragm. This whole system holds a bunch of muscles and organs in place, like the bladder. So what other things did they say are leftovers? The tonsils. Of course. Lots of people had their tonsils removed. Great way to get ice cream for dinner. You seriously let them cut out your tonsils just so you can have ice cream? Well, it depends on what kind of ice cream we're talking about here. Okay, not really, but people survive just fine without tonsils, right? Uh, studies now show that in some cases, removing your tonsils can be worse in the long run, and especially for young children. So what's their purpose? Tonsils are placed at the back of the throat so they trap germs when we breathe. Proteins called antibodies produced by immune cells in the tonsils help kill germs and prevent throat and lung infections. They actually manufacture antibodies against disease. They're basically the first line of defense against inhaled or ingested viruses. So what about the appendix? It's thought to be vestigial, right? I'm not even sure I know what it is. It's a tube-shaped sac attached to the lower end of the large intestine. It's part of your digestive system, and okay, enough it... But they also have purpose? Yes, it's the storehouse for beneficial bacteria. When you fight an intestinal disease, your body gets rid of bacteria, both good and bad. But then the appendix can quickly resupply your system with good bacteria. Sounds pretty helpful. Yep. It also plays a role in our body's immune system, especially when we're younger. Sounds pretty important. Charles Darwin thought vestigial structures were a winning argument for evolution. 
And he believed there were lots of vestigial structures? Yeah. And a German anatomist by the name of Robert Wiedersheim made a list of 86 vestigial structures in the human body. And later, evolutionists expanded the list to about 180. But modern science has now shown that every one of them has a purpose. So they didn't know about these organs' functions in the body? No, they assumed that since people could survive without them, that these were totally useless. Then they reasoned in a circle, arguing that since they were useless leftovers of an evolutionary past, they demonstrate our evolutionary past. So reasoning in a circle is bad. Uh, yeah, it's when we assume our conclusion, then use that assumption to prove our conclusion. It's crazy. Hi. I'm Kyle Justice of Awesome Science Media. I'm glad you're watching our programs. I hope you've been ministered to. Some of you might feel called to give towards our ministry to help us produce even more great programming. I'm going to show you how. We've tried to be creative in the way we partner with our viewers, so we've set up a special producer's website just for you. Similar to crowdfunding, we have partnered with Patreon, a site that helps support us as content creators on a monthly basis. By giving, you become a producer with us. As a thank you for your support, we have set up several rewards depending upon how much you'd like to give. From exclusive access to extra content, a first look at our new programs, behind the scenes specials, to special one-on-one -on -one monthly hangouts with our hosts and experts, we want to thank you in some big ways. So here's how it works. Go to our website at awesomesciencemedia.com and select the special Become a Producer icon at the top. You can watch the introduction video first. Then on the right, you'll see various giving levels and what rewards you'll receive. Pick one and the website will lead you through the sign up process. Then more than once a month, you'll get email notifications when the rewards are available. You can even give as little as $1 a month. By becoming one of our producers, you'll be able to help us produce even more great programming every month. We'll reach the world with the message of our great creator. Thank you for your help and support. We look forward to partnering with you.